Hotspot Analysis Part 2 – Choosing an Appropriate Distance Band So far, we have chosen our conceptualization of spatial relationships, which in the case of our analysis of childhood obesity in Los Angeles County was the zone of indifference. Our next step in the process is to choose the appropriate distance band that's going to be used in the analysis. There are several ways to go about choosing the right distance band, and truthfully, most of the time there is no right distance band. Most of the time there are several proce processes at play in an area, and you might find different trends depending on the scale that you choose. For instance, if we looked at obesity hotspots at the national level, we might see hotspots in several states. Alternatively, if we look at a neighborhood level, we may find several small neighborhoods where there's a problem. For each of these analyses, there would be a very different distance band that matches the scale of analysis that you're interested in and the questions that you want to answer, so make sure that you keep that in mind. But there are some general rules for choosing the critical distance. One really important one is to make sure that the distance that you choose ensures that all of your features have at least a few neighbors. As a general rule, at least eight neighbors is good. One big problem with choosing a distance band that's too small is that some of your features are not going to have enough neighbors, or any neighbors, which would mean that your results may not be valid. So make sure that when you pick your distance band, you keep that in mind. One great way to choose a distance band is to let your data show you. You can let the data show you the best distance band by using the Global Moran's Eye Statistic for Spatial Autocorrelation, which provides as an output a z-score for your entire study area. The Global Moran's Eye tool is in the Spatial Statistics Toolbox under the Analyzing Patterns tool set. The inputs here are the same as for our hotspot analysis. The input feature class are our polygons, and our input field is that obesity rate. We also want to make sure we keep the same conceptualization of spatial relationships, which again is our zone of indifference for this analysis. Now for the distance band. We can start with the smallest distance that is still at a scale that we're interested in, let's say 1,000 meters. I'm going to go ahead and run the tool, and what it's going to do is calculate a z-score for my entire study area based on that distance band of 1,000 meters. That z-score is going to be a measure of how clustered those values are, and we'd get a different z-score for every different distance band that we used as our input. So we can see that with a 1,000 meter distance band, we have a z-score of 5.91. What I've done is run that tool about 30 times in 500 meter intervals up until I got to 15,000 meters. I picked 15,000 meters as my cutoff because after that, I thought that subtle neighborhood differences would be lost. I know that might sound just a little tedious, but it runs really quickly and the result is definitely worth it. I put each distance and z value in a table, and I added that table to ArcMap. I then graphed the z scores, which we can see right here. This graph shows us the global z score values for 30 different distance bands. What we're interested in are the peaks or the distances at which the z-score values actually decrease with distance. In this case, based on my criteria for using a relatively small neighborhood in my analysis, I decided to choose the distance at which we see the first dip in our z-scores, which we can see is at about 4,000 meters. Based on this graph, I might have also chosen 10,500 meters, where we can see another dip. But based on the questions that I'm trying to answer and the scale that I'm interested in, 4,000 meters makes the most sense. 
and now I've let my data tell me the best distance band to use based on the questions that I'm interested in answering using the spatial autocorrelation Moran's eye tool. So stay tuned for part three where we're going to go ahead and run the hotspot analysis and understand those results.